This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello, you're listening to the Animal Party on Pet Life Radio, which means you're listening to me, Deb Wolf, Deb Wolf Pet Expert on YouTube, Deb Wolf Pet Expert on Facebook, and Camp Good Dog on Facebook, where we have all kinds of dogs running around and playing, usually, but because of Corona, COVID-19, not many people are traveling, not many dogs are boarding, it's pretty quiet around here, and the world has changed a lot. So today I wanted to just update you on some of the facts about COVID and pets because it's changing all the time. And I printed off the latest information last night from the American Veterinary College, what they uh, issue out, and also from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Canada. So I have a, a joint combination of facts. The basic idea is don't worry about your pets. That's really the summary, but I'll get into it a little later. We're going to talk to Dr. Stan Corn who's a professor of psychology and has written many, many books about dogs, but he also understands humans. Because lately I've been receiving questions from you and I can't answer them. Questions like, why are people hoarding toilet paper? And will this change how we treat live animal markets forever? Will this change how we shop? Will this change how we act? Will this change how we treat each other? Big, big questions and uh, questions about whether animal abuse is going to go up and what we can do if we're locked in a house with an explosive person. So really big topics today. Welcome to the show, Dr. Corin. Thank you for coming. Glad to be here, Deb. It's a tough time. Even though we found out that most animals don't suffer from COVID, cats and dogs don't, they barely show symptoms, they get over it and they almost always get it from us. They don't have a high viral load, so they don't really give it to anybody. We're still pretty worried, and we're still being told not to walk them off leash and not to let them interact with other people because they might bring the virus back to you. But at the same time, I've got facts here that say that although we know certain bacteria and fungi can be carried on fur and hair, there is no evidence that viruses, including the virus that causes COVID-19, can spread to people from skin, fur, or hair of pets. So we're really being overly cautious when we're saying wipe down your pets with antiseptic wipes and don't let them meet with strangers. It's probably a good idea if you actually diagnosed with COVID-19 or anyone in your family is that you separate that person from the pets. That's probably smart. And it's probably a good idea that if you're that person and you must take care of your pets, wear a mask. When you do it, wash your hands often. But otherwise, I think the pets are the least of our worries right now. And they seem to be our helpers. More and more people are rescuing animals. For the first time in my career, I do not have any rescue dogs and I have rescue families who want dogs. So that's a wonderful occurrence. But I want to talk to you about, about the toilet paper. Let's start with that, Dr. Corn, because that's the question I got. Why are people hoarding and why toilet paper? Well, people are hoarding everything. <laughs> okay? It's not just the toilet paper. I mean, if you look at the uh, supermarket shelves now, you know, you'll find that anything which might be a staple, which could be kept for a long time, flour, yeast, uh, pasta, pasta sauce, you know, th crackers, that kind of thing is being hoarded. And it's just simply that people are worried that these things are going to be in short supply. And certainly for food, you know, you always worry about having enough for sustenance. But this thing with toilet paper was actually triggered by a set of alarmist press reports, which said, among other symptoms associated with the virus, is diarrhea, which turns out not to be as bad a problem as, as the respiratory stuff. And so all of a sudden people were confronted with this thing, which basically said, and the early press reports were, you know, explosive diarrhea and all that kind of a thing. And people said, uh, wow, you know, yeah. you know, we're going to be stuck inside with this problem and, <laughs> yeah, and, okay. and nothing to wipe it away. <laughs> right? so. Well, you know, though, early on in it, I was having trouble finding toilet paper and I finally did get some. So I had enough. But then I was in a store and I saw these other people loading their carts with it. And it made me want to go get some. What is that? 
Well, that's a social phenomena. It's part of social psychology. We're basically herd animals, okay? So we judge our behavior and what we should be doing next by what's going on around us. There was an experiment done for a, a master's thesis a few years back in which basically they had one of the experimenters would stand at a uh, an intersection and look up. That's all he did, you know, just look up. And you would find that virtually 70% of the people standing in that same intersection would they look, look up at also. you. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so we're like, I'm just one of the cows going along in the herd, That's getting right. my toilet paper. That's terrible. <laughs> okay, I get it, though. I get it. I've got one more question for you before we go to break, because this is the second most common question I got asked. And that is, if violence is going to increase in the home because people are trapped with violent people, is violence going to increase toward animals? And what can we do about that? Well, you know, we're looking at a, at a version of cabin fever over here, right? right? So if people are stuck together and there are poor social relationships, then things will aggravate. I mean, I have a colleague by the name of Peter Sudfeld who studies what happens to people in confined in environments. And for him, it, it, the important thing mm -hmm. is our space stations and submarines and, you know, polar outposts and that sort of thing. Right. And if people don't practice some sort of activities to separate themselves from the other people for at least part of the time, then in fact there is the possibility that things will get testy and perhaps could turn violent. I mean, a pair of earphones so that you can be listening or watching your program while the other member of the family is watching or doing something else you know, can save your lives. <laughs> okay. Can, can okay. Really so that's really helpful. So try and create separate spaces and separate activities. We're going to go to break and we're going to come back with more of this. I've got questions on how to deflate outbursts, intense anger and panic, how to deal strategies with kids and expectations. So we're going to come back to that and some mental illness questions. Who needs watching right now? Who's most at risk? These are the questions we're coming back to. And don't worry, we'll be back on pets. Do you think your cat's sick of you yet? Probably he is. He wants some more alone time, too. We'll talk about that when we come back from break with Dr. Stan Corrin on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. When we put him on the Dynavite, he took right to it. All of these symptoms disappeared. Dynavite is nutrition. If you want the dog to be healthy, you got to feed it something healthy. Something that he actually likes to eat. You need to put him on Dynavite. Dynavite for life. If you love your dog, you don't just want him healthy, you want him to be happy. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, we're back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. I think most of the dogs think it's fantastic that the owners are home. Nobody's going to school. Nobody's going to work. Everybody just wants to walk the dog. Kids are fighting over who gets to walk the dog. The dog's getting to go to all kinds of places. His obedience has never been better. The few dogs that I rescued this spring and readopted, Rocky and Pudding, are so, I mean, they must think their new family is just the best. They don't go anywhere. They're always home, right? Now, I know that when this is all over, I'm going to get a lot of training customers because they're going to have separation anxiety when their owners go back to work. So I don't know how to tell you this, but if you can, try and leave the dog alone a little bit, a little bit every day, if you can, just so he doesn't get used to you being always there. So Dr. Corin, we're back talking to you and I've got all these questions about how to deflate anger and outbursts and panic in the home that could potentially lead to kids fighting with each other or parents fighting with each other or even animals getting hurt. So what do we do about this when they're just blowing up? Well, the best thing is to find an interruption. I mean, it's really a difficult thing when you're in a really confined space and there's no place to go. And so you have to set up a thing so that, you know, you at least respect the solitude of the, of the other people in the house. 
And so if things start to get testy, I mean, the normal thing to do is to go walk away, go down to your local pub and drink too much or whatever else. But of course, you can't do that now. So uh, you can still do the walk away thing. But you can, you know, for those of you who are pet owners, you have a real excuse now to turn away from the situation to go tend to the pet, you know, brush it down or whatever else. There is a, a wonderful set of studies which come out of uh, the University of Michigan in which they did brain scans of people who were shown, you know, anxiety producing stimuli of various sorts, you know, upsetting scenes and that kind of thing. And they found that uh, simply having the people talk about what they were seeing was really important because it then lit up those parts of the brain which are associated with calmer emotions and uh, turned down the volume on uh, some of the aspects of the limbic system which are associated with some of the more aggressive and frightening emotions. Now, the thing about it is that most people don't talk to themselves out loud, and it, apparently you have mm -hmm. to talk out loud for this particular thing. But the neat thing, for example, about dogs is that if you talk to them, they look and add directly at you and seem to be paying attention. And so they foster that kind of talking. Okay. Yeah. So if you feel this sort of buildup of annoyance and that sort of thing, then take the dog, go into the bedroom, or if necessary, go into the bathroom. <laughs> have a bathroom. good old chat. <laughs> yeah. Have a little chat. <laughs> and you have a little chat with the dog in which you talk about the situation as though it was in the third person. You say, you know, okay, Lassie, you know, uh, she's really getting annoying over there. No, no. <laughs> what do you think I should do? I mean, give me some solutions. And you play it that way. And you'll find literally, I mean, you, we're talking about just 10 minutes of this sort of thing is usually enough. So it takes the edge off of, of the situation. And then when you break off this thing, if you come back and you, you make an offer to your partner or whoever else it was who was, was getting uh, annoyed, like, you know, would you like me to make you some tea or, you know, how would you like some lunch or could I help mm -hmm. you to straighten out the bookshelf? Whatever it is, it's just, just an offer in that situation. Well, that's usually enough. I mean, you've calmed down and there's been a break. You've, uh, you know, a, a few minutes of isolation and you've calmed down because you've just talked to your fur friend. And that's usually enough. You don't have to tone things down so that everybody's happy and tossing artificial daisies across the room or something right. like that. It just has to be toned down enough so that nobody's standing there with their fists clenched. Okay, we're going to go to another break. And when we come back, I'm going to talk about these extremes I see. I don't understand why I see people playing frisbee at the beach in big groups or basketball or rollerblading right by each other. And at the same time, I see a solo person wearing a mask driving. What makes us react so differently? So we'll come back and talk to Dr. Stan Gorin in a moment. Stay tuned on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Hey everyone, Michelle Fern here. I have the perfect gift for Mother's Day. You know, I can't visit my mother-in-law as much as I'd like to, and that's why I love the Skylight Frame. It's a touchscreen photo frame that you can email photos to, and they appear in seconds, so my mother-in-law can see the pictures right away. And I have a great savings for you. Just go to skylightframe.com slash pet and you'll save $10. That's right. S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E dot com slash pet, P-E-T, and you'll save $10. And get ready to receive sheer happiness thank yous from your recipient because they will love this. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com Hello, we're back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. And as I've watched the news change so many times, first dogs are okay, then don't let your dog touch strangers, then that's overkill, then wipe them down, then all these different things. And in the end, it turns out, the official rundown from the ABC American Veterinary College is 
There have been no reports of pets or livestock becoming ill with COVID-19 in the United States. At this point in time, there is no evidence that domestic animals, including pets and livestock, can spread it to people. So, okay, take a deep breath, relax a bit, right? So there we have that. But then we have extremes. We have warnings all the time that maybe are half-baked, maybe not. And there's people who are taking them so seriously, wearing their masks, driving around solo, gloved masks, and other people who just seem to be ignoring it completely. Like the teenagers I saw at the beach or the many, many rollerbladers and joggers who would pass so close to each other. So what, why are we, like, where are we supposed to be on this? And how do we get the people who are panicking to calm down and the people who aren't taking it seriously to wake up? What do we do about this, Dr. Corin? Well, part of it has to do with age. To be absolutely honest, a lot of the violations of social distancing, which you'll see, will be with younger people. You know, there were images of during spring break in the midst of all this thing over there of people out partying on the beach in, in thousands. And if you're rational, you say to yourself, that is incredibly stupid. And why are they doing it? And part of the reason they're doing it is because they're young. And when you're young, you feel basically invulnerable. I mean, that's the reason why, you know, young men and women make the best soldiers, because, you know, they feel invulnerable. They don't feel that anything is going to, to really hurt them. And that's what's happening here. I mean, you know, it is that, that brashness which comes with being uh, young. If you're entering middle age, then it will depend on whether or not you have a family. If you have a family, kids and a spouse at home, then it's a, then it's a different thing. Then you're, you're going to be more cautious. But if you don't, then you still carry over some of that, that sense of invulnerability and a lack of responsibility. You'll find that some of the individuals who are most cautious are going to be older individuals. And in part, because the fear of God has been put into them by their, their physicians. I mean, you know, for example, I'm 77, yeah. you, oh. you know. I'm okay. 77 years old, and I've got a compromised immune system. I have COPD, which is one of the reasons why you sometimes hear me coughing. It has nothing to do with, with virus. It has to do with you know, <laughs> okay. pre-existing conditions. And, you know, my tiny perfect doctor took me off the streets uh, three and a half weeks ago and basically said, you stay in your house until I sound the all clear and if I hear that you've been out on the sidewalk, I'm going to fire you as a patient. Well, I mean, you know, so I'm going to be careful, right? Uh, well, you're now living like a house cat. You're a house cat. You can't go out. That's, that's pretty much the way, except wow. uh, not a true house cat because my dogs don't chase me. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, See, but I let my cats have outdoor freedom because I just couldn't bear it myself to never be allowed out. It just sounds so awful to me. I don't know how people are handling this. Well, you know, I'm a, I go out all the time. I have five acres. I wander around. It's great. But if I was in an apartment and I could only go on the balcony and my, oh my goodness, this would cabin fever would really hit me because I'm used to running around on the farm. Well, you know, uh, for me as an author, writing is a fairly solitary thing. You probably remember from when you wrote your book. I mean, you know, you are chained to the keyboard. And uh, for me, of course, most of my writing includes things about the latest scientific research. So I get to sit out on the porch with my dog. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, dogs swirling around my feet and annoying pedestrians as they walk by as a little bit of an outside break. But, you know, I'm used to having, you know, to getting up in the morning. Solitude, and, yeah. And by uh, 6 30 or 7 a.m., you know, the shackles have already been put on and I am chained to my keyboard until lunchtime. So, you know, I am writing a book right now and I'm also changing the format of the books I've already written, making them into ebooks. So I'm also writing. But I do it after I've had such an active outdoor day. I cannot imagine being confined like that. Yeah, good dog. It's going to come out on ebook soon because Corona is making us all very productive, isn't it? I do want to. Yeah, it is. I do want to talk about mental illness and like if we have people in our homes. I mean, you were talking about the elderly, and I think I don't understand why these teenagers don't give a hoot about their grandparents. When I was 20 something, I still cared about my elderly grandparents who were in their 70s. I didn't want a pandemic to hit all the elderly of the country. I don't know why they don't care. I don't get that. Why do they hate grandpa? 
Like what's going on there? But maybe you can tell me, like, why do they not care about another generation? Why are they, there were memes going around about, you know, oh, well, another dead boomer. I mean, they were really enjoying this idea that it was a, a cleansing of the polluting older generation. And there was a lot of this. I was really quite shocked. So why don't they care? And then what about the mentally ill? Are they able to do social distancing? Are they aware? What about the homeless mentally ill? Do they have the means to keep clean? Like, what about these issues? I can address some of it, but uh, okay. you've got to remember that uh, ultimately I am not a clinical psychologist, okay? You know, that's my gift to my profession is that I'm not a clinical psychologist, but a researcher. So, you know, so I know most of the clinical data and that sort of thing. But I think that the the first question, I think, is one of the more interesting ones, which is why is it that the, the younger generation doesn't seem to... Um, to have as much concern about older individuals. And part of that has to do with social media. You know, it used to be the case that when we had an extended family, when the parents were off, perhaps working or whatever else, you know, it was grandma or grandpa, you know, hanging around the house. And so the kids got to interact with their grandparents and talk with them and exchange views and maybe learn some things. I mean, my grandmother had decided that I had to learn how to cook because, you know, there would be times when I, before I was married or when my wife was awake, that I would need that skill and that sort of thing. But today you don't need that, okay? You go on Facebook or Instagram or whatever else and your friends provide all of the information. So you don't really need the older generation as much. And so you don't get to know them. That's really sad. That's it's terrible because they they're the ones who know how to survive tough times. They're the ones who can put things in perspective. They're the ones that, you know, like we're we're so ignorant compared to the older people. I like I've lived through SARS and 9/11 and that's pretty much it in my life. There's people who've lived through wars and shortages that oh, can yeah. help us. I yeah, mean and, and there's a lot to be learned, but more importantly, it's recognizing these individuals as people. You know, if most of your contacts are through social media and because of the way that our society is going, you know, the nuclear family where grandma, grandpa, aunts and uncles and everybody all lived within a one mile distance of one another and were in the same town and that sort of thing, that doesn't happen very much anymore. I mean, people get up and they move. And so, you know, mom and dad are in California and grandpa and grandma are in Boston. So you don't get to see them very much. And if you do contact them, it's, you know, via an email or a Facebook post or something else. And so it's not as though they're real people. It's like, you know, I'm on Paulie Perrette's uh, Facebook friend list. And, you know, so I get all of the postings of what's going on in her life. Uh, but, you know, it's not as though it's a real person. You know, it's well, it's, you know, maybe this is something we can do. We can set our grandparents and the older people in Skype and Zoom. I did a Seder uh, a couple of nights ago with my family where we had one family in one house, me and my daughter in another, my mom and, and her partner in the house. You know, even though my mom doesn't love social media, she's in her 80s. She loved this. She loves seeing her grandkids and, and seeing us singing and participating. And so, I mean, hook them up, right? Buy a tablet for your grandma. Hook them yeah. up. They'll appreciate this. I'm sure yeah. they will. And, and, okay. and <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> well, that's a good right. way to end the show, actually, because it's positive. <laughs> Connect with your grandmother. And if you're having trouble making a recipe or something like that, you're having trouble building something, you're, you're working on something, you millennials and Gen Zs and whoever else you are, and you get stuck, instead of going to YouTube, Skype your grandma or your grandpa, ask them how to finish the task. They'll be able to help you, maybe even save you some money, and you won't have to listen to 80 ads and go through all the misdirection of the internet. Okay, and you'll make them feel so good to help you. All right, so we're going to end the show here, Dr. Karen. I'm going to have you back because I really want to discuss the mentally ill and also the long-term effects. Are we going to stop using stores? Are we going to stop going to concerts? Are we going to stop traveling? What's going to happen in the future? So we're going to have Dr. Korn back and do a follow-up show on COVID-19, Corona, Pets and People. But for now, we're going to end on that positive note. Uh, Skype your grandma. Zoom your grandpa. Right, Dr. Korn? That's right. 
give them a bark from me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and be well at social distance and love your animals. Be good to your animals. From Dr. Corin, Deb Wolf, and Animal Party on Pet Life Radio, be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.